You're listening to the REI Marketing Nerds Podcast, the leading resource for real estate investors who want to dominate their market online. Dan Barrett is the founder of AdWords Nerds, a high-tech digital agency focusing exclusively on helping real estate investors like you get more leads and deals online, outsmart your competition, and live a freer, more awesome life. And now, your host, Dan Barrett. Hey guys, welcome back. You're listening to the second part of last week's episode. Let's jump back in. Pop quiz, because I never get to trot this out and I'm I'm quizzing you right now. You're right? Right. Right. Connecticut and state knowledge quiz. All right. Can you name our state song, our official Connecticut state song? As he Googles very quickly, I have absolutely no idea. It is Yankee Doodle. Anyway, there you go. All right. Rock that fan. No one said there was going to be a test, Dan. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> but now I know that forever. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> that's like all your part. Every party I go to in Connecticut, I trot that out at least once. And everyone's like, now that's a fact that I know. Like, yeah, forever. Thank you. And uh, I will okay. share that so, with my kids and <laughs> anyone else that'll listen to me. Exactly. I'm like, you know, and I always say like, you know it. You could sing at least part of it. And that always drives people crazy. All right. So let's talk about RIAs. I mean, sure. you mentioned that you were you were sort of an integral part of CT RIA. Yep, I was one of the partners. That's right. In the country, which is amazing. So, you know, I am an online marketing guy. Google right. ads, SEO, Facebook ads, that's what I do, Microsoft ads, right? I like, then I'm on the computer, you know, I'm on my own schedule, whatever. And when I first started my business, before I was really focused on uh, real estate investing, I would go to the Chamber of Commerce and I would go to the networking thing and I would yeah. be, and I would eat hors d'oeuvres and I would have nice conversations from people. But I I always struggled. I always felt like it was inefficient, right? So if you're talking to an investor that says, eh, like I know Ria's like people do it and it's great, you know, whatever, but I don't know, I don't think it's for me. Sell that person or maybe not sell is the wrong word, but tell that person what they have to gain by thinking about their local RIA or sort of joining an organization. Yeah. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a RIA, right? There's, you know, there's dozens of meetups on a, on a monthly basis here in Connecticut. You know. And, you know, here's the thing. So I, I've been very fortunate to meet hundreds and it may even be thousands of, of investors here in, in Connecticut. And, you know, a lot of them are I like to affectionately call the dreamers, right? The folks that would love to get in, have read all the books I've read and uh, just haven't been able to pull the trigger yet. And, you know, invariably I ask them, you know, how come? What's keeping you from doing it? And I get almost to a person, one of three answers. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't know where the deals are, right? And the the fact is, is that, you know, as far as time goes, there are 168 hours in the in the week work week, right? You got to sleep 56 of them. You're going to work 60 of them. You're going to go out and spend time with your family, 14 of them. You're going to go out on the weekends and do something with your family or go out with your friends or, or you're going to spend 16 of them, at least 26 hours. So from a time perspective, uh, are you going to spend it binge watching, you know, the watcher on Netflix, which was awesome by the way, or are you going to go to a meetup or are you going to read a book or are you going to listen to a podcast like this one or mine and you know how do you spend that extra extra time right um the other two are answered by going to your or going to a meetup and that is i don't have enough i don't have enough deal flow at any given meeting once a month there are people in those rooms that have deals in their back pocket whether they're a realtor a wholesaler or an investor who's looking to trade up right um, or change asset classes like i was uh, where you know we have deals that we haven't necessarily hired a realtor yet, and if you know in most of the most of the RIAs that I've been to, most of the meetups I've been to, there's about a 15 minute agenda item where they talk about deals in your back pocket. Right? I have this deal. I'm looking to sell it. Here's the number. Here's how fast I need to close it. If anyone's interested, here's my email. Here's my number. Happens at every meeting I've ever been to. Right? And so. That alone creates deal flow. There's other things, right? You can hire your firm, Dan, to to help with that. And there are any a number of other things you can do. And as far as money goes, I, I, I was at a, a one of the CT RIA meetings a few months ago, and 
I had done a, a talk on, you know, how to, how to create relationships and network and all that. And this person came up to me and he said, you know, I, I just, I, it makes sense, but man, I just don't know where to find the money. And I, I put my arm around him and I turned him around to the room and I said, there was about, I don't know, 150, 200 people in the room. And I said, standing here, we are consuming oxygen with one, two, three. And I counted about seven or eight people that I know are accredited investors, which means they have a net worth over a million bucks and they make more than 200,000 a year. I know for a fact that they're standing in the room and you, you know, the, the money you need is less than a hundred feet from you right now. Yeah. Go meet them. And, you know, obviously their, you know, their next question is great. Which ones? Yeah. And I said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. Right. I'm not going to invade someone's privacy. You have to go actually meet these people yeah. and let them get to know you and, and become friends, create awareness, become friends over time. They'll learn to trust you and you trust them. And then you do business together. Right. That's it. So that is a huge piece. Finding deals, finding money. They're in those rooms every month. I think it's, you know, again, it ties back to this theme, right? That we, we didn't really plan it this way, but it's this theme of this sort of long-term relationship building as right. the core of the business, right? right? Like it's it's the core of most businesses that last. Right. But that idea of forming the relationship before you need it, I talk about this a lot. I'm going to hit this point again because it is one of my sort of pet points, but I think real estate investing as an industry has shifted away from an industry where all you have to do is tell a seller, hey, I'm a real estate investor and here's what that means. I'll pay you cash. You know, you go out, go blah, blah, blah. That's an industry where all the only decision that seller is making is should they sell to an investor? But today, everybody knows what an investor is. There are investors on TV every day. They've got a million postcards. They've seen the signs, right? They know what it is. So the question is, why you versus any other Right. And again, it's that long term relationship idea that is so incredibly powerful. So let's talk about you today because you have shifted your business. Like you said, you're sort of shifted down the the sort of straight investment piece. You're moving to a syndication model, right? So you're right. still investing in multifamily, sort of bringing in investors and sort of doing it that way. What was behind your decision to do that? Because I think a lot of investors, have, they're either They've considered it. Maybe they've considered working with someone who's got a syndication uh, sort of program going on. So like, what was going on in your head to let you know, okay, this is the right decision for us right now? So it was my long-term plan from the beginning, right? And, and quite frankly, if I had to do it over, I wouldn't have flipped. I would have gone right into multifamily and just stayed there. So this comes down to scale for me, you know, getting back to the deal flow and, and capital flow and time, right? The motion it takes to buy a four family is identical, step for step identical with the acquisition of a 50 unit building. It's identical. There's no difference. Zeros. That's it. Right. And the, the, the fact is, is that if you want to scale a business, uh, you know, one of the, one of not the only, but one of the fastest ways to do that is to in creating scale is to, is to buy larger buildings. And, you know, unfortunately, I have a finite amount of money. I would love for it to be infinite, but it didn't work out that way. I, so, I, would, I would love that for you. But that would be really cool, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not Elon Musk. Too bad. That's all right. Yeah. I think people like me more than they like him anyway. So well, right now, it definitely seems like people yeah, like well, I'm a Tesla. Hell, I'm a Tesla stockholder, so I'm really not a fan of his right now. But I was a year and a half ago. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so, but the fact is, is that you know, in order for my business to scale, you know, I needed to partner with other people. And so my business plan when I left corporate America was, you know, I had friends, you know, that in the, in Silicon Valley with newly minted IPOs in their back pocket. And they said, yeah, we want to invest. And, you know, I tend to be a really conservative guy. And, and so I, you know, I basically told all of them, I said, look, let me go screw this up. Let me go out. Let me make bad decisions. Let me screw them up. Let me fix them. Let me never, you know, learn from those mistakes and build systems around them so I don't have to, you know, stress out about those things anymore. And when I figure that stuff out, then I'll come back to you. And so it took me, you know, a better part of three years to to kind of do dumb stuff and learn not to do it again and fix it and and you know, grow the business. And, you know, we got to the point where, and frankly, it probably, you know, COVID obviously slowed us down quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, we lost about better part of 18 months, just kind of holding serve and making sure that our tenants were taken care of and that, uh, you know, that our investors were taken care of and, and we were, you know, managing the assets as opposed to growth yeah. over the last 
a little more than a year, you know, we really started to crank up the, the, the syndication part of the business where, you know, we're, we're looking for much larger properties. Uh, and you know, that said, I'm, I, I've got a seven unit, two, seven units and a 16 under contract today that I'm going to close hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Right. So we haven't gotten away from that business, but I am looking for much larger properties. And, you know, you were, we were talking about the Connecticut market, you know, those properties really don't exist in mass here in the state of Connecticut. So, yeah. you know, we've got to go look elsewhere. So that's what drew me to the Midwest and the Southeast is to start looking at much larger properties. Yeah. It, it, it's a very rational plot line to follow, right? Like, like you said, you're sort of getting that economy at scale. Right. Want to find motivated seller leads online, but don't know where to start? Download our free Motivated Seller Keyword Report today. AdWords nerds have spent over $5 million this year researching the most profitable keywords for finding motivated seller leads. And you can grab these exact keywords when you download our report at www.adwordsnerds.com slash keywords. I'm curious about your decision to start the podcast. So we mentioned at the beginning of the show, if you meant, if you missed it, it's called the Real Estate Underground Podcast. You can go check it out at realestateundergroundpodcast.com. Is it on uh, like particular channels? I can't remember. Did you just everywhere. say it's like on Spotify? Apple, Spotify, Google, everywhere. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you get anywhere that fine podcasts are sold, right? Real Estate Underground Podcast. Thank you. And it is really good. You've got a really natural sort of vibe. I, I will say it's like, um, you know, having a podcast, you, when you listen to other people's podcasts, like I was well listening, like, well, how does it go? How does it flow? And I think there's a lot of real estate podcasts that are way too polished and they almost sound like too weirdly artificial. And then there's podcasts that are like, it sounds like a guy in his bathtub, you know, right. just like whatever. Hopefully and, we're somewhere in between. Yeah. It, you guys have such a nice sort of vibe to it. The flow is great. The guests you had on it are really great. Like obviously the informational content is awesome. So what was behind the thought process of starting the podcast? Like what made you want to get into that sort of particular, um, I guess you could call it a marketing chip. Yeah. So, so it really didn't start off as a marketing tool. It, it, it actually, so I love coaching, right? I love helping people accomplish, you know, I was a I was, when I was managing people in corporate America, I, you know, one of the things that really fired me up and got me going every week was seeing people grow, right. And seeing people succeed. And I was genuinely happy for them. And I genuinely wanted them to, to grow and, you know, and my experience at CT Rio, same thing, right. I really got fired up when I saw someone, when I saw the light bulb go off that, that kind of warmed my soul. Right. Yeah. And so I wasn't necessarily coaching at CT Rio. I was more of an operational guy there. And so I wanted to use the podcast as a way to serve that community and and ultimately, you know, investors everywhere to to kind of make it a very um, kind of break down the the fear part of this and make it simple so that people can believe that it's possible, believe that they deserve it and that they that they deserve financial freedom, but do it in a casual way. So it's just a conversation. It's two guys having a beer or you know two people shooting the breeze about real estate in a way that, you know, is it, we try to make it as conversational as possible, have a little bit of fun and, you know, hopefully serve our audience so that they can get that, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for that one gold nugget with each guest that we meet. Right. And then selfishly, I get to meet some really cool, interesting, very accomplished people. And it's a nice kind of, it's a, it's a nice sneaky way to get in their lives. Right. Yeah. I get to meet uh, you know, Ron Legrand and, you know, uh, Oz Priester, who I've known for years. In fact, I'm going to a conference with them this weekend. Awesome. Uh, five. The, you know, but, you know, these people are, I try as a professional to always put myself in rooms where they're, they're people that are smarter than me so I can learn from them, right? Yeah. Um, I always joke with, you know, the, the team here at Clark Street, if I'm the smartest person in the room when I walk in, we're all in, well, I say it differently, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll keep it clean here. We're all in trouble, right? Yeah. Um, and so the only way you learn is by surrounding yourself with smarter people. And, you know, the podcast for me personally, that's one of the things that, that I, that's one of the reasons I do it. I'm trying to get smarter. Yeah. I mean, again, right. Comes back to the theme, building the relationships or you need it, right. Providing value before you have to ask for something. I have, find, I'm, I've found a very similar thing where, and I started doing the podcast primarily just for fun, just a way of getting some stuff on YouTube or whatever, getting stuff out there. It's probably the single best networking tool 
I've ever found. Because when you call people up and you say, hey, would you like to chat? You don't know me, but let's just chat for 45 minutes. People are like, yeah. But if you're like, hey, do you want to come on my podcast and chat with me yeah. for 45 minutes? People are like, yeah, it's fun right. to be on podcasts, right? Something it that everybody fun. enjoys or most people enjoy. Well, everybody likes talking about their successes, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the most, the most fun thing to talk about as a human being is yourself. And so, you know, when you invite someone on and, and say, Hey, I'd like to talk about all the really cool things you're doing. And maybe some of the folks that are listening might actually learn something from you. Would you, would you be interested? Yeah. It's a lot of times it's easy, pretty easy to get it to say yes. Yeah. I, I literally was just reading, I started reading a bunch of books about psychoanalysis, which I know nothing about, but I was like, this is interesting. I started reading about it. One of the things I noticed was, is that like most of the benefit of psychoanalysis comes from the fact that nobody ever gets deeply listened to. True. And so you like lay on a couch and you have someone that's going to pay attention to like your every word. Right. But like that's most of the benefit you get. From. Right. And I was like, and I, I'm paraphrasing Please, psychoanalysts out there, don't come at me. You know, don't at me. Yeah, your DMs are about to explode. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, look, if you want to trade free therapy, I'll take it. But I just, I found that very insightful, right? You're right. It's yeah. like, we don't, we don't get a chance to talk about ourselves in that way enough. Well, I, there's so many things I want to touch on. I mean, there's like a million things. We didn't, we didn't get to half of them, but I, I don't want to keep you too long. I do want to ask, so like, what is next for you? Like we, we're, as we're recording this, we're coming to the end of 2022. Yep. Who knows what the rest of the, you know, 2023 is going to be like. I think a lot of people viewed this year as a particularly tumultuous one. It, there were really high highs. There were really low lows. Um, I'm even thinking about just outside of real estate. When you think about what happened with crypto and what's happening in tech now, and it just seems like there's a lot of stuff Tumult. happening, right? So when you think about the next year, the next couple of years, did you have like a plan? Are you really planning it out? Do you have yeah. like specific goals? Is it just, I'm going to play it as it comes? Like, well, how do you think about it? So, so we think about that in terms of kind of three-ish year objectives, right? And so, you know, our focus right now is to get to a thousand units by the end of 2025. And so I know, you know, what we have to do to bring that home this year, next year, and so on. It is challenging, though. I mean, the the fact is is that if you listen to you know the the Goldman Sachs and Banks of America and the pundits on CNBC and elsewhere, you know we're about to dip into anywhere from an eight to twenty percent drop in terms of you know a recession, and yeah. that's real estate, um, not necessarily stock market. I'm I'm not a stock market guy, so I don't yeah. really know. That's why God made better. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> uh, so the. But the, the, but the fact is, is that, you know, in my experience, you know, I'm 53, right? So I've lived through a few of these cycles. Presidential years and the run-up to presidential years are always crazy, economically, socially, politically. And everybody gets charged up. And I think if you pay attention to the news, it's already happening, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I fully expect that from a economic and a real estate perspective, it's going to be a bumpy ride over the next 18 to 24 months. The good news is that presents an opportunity for investors if you can stay cool and focus on numbers, right? And so, you know, here at my company, you know, we focus on cash flow. That's it. You know, in terms of appreciation, it's a nice to have. Uh, it almost always happens, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, see 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? But the fact is, is that, you know, our focus is on acquiring units, buying them slowly, buying them correctly. And then, you know, getting to our goal over the course of the next, you know, three-ish years. And, you know, so whether the interest rates are 2.5 or 8%, it doesn't much matter because, you know, our focus is on uh, buying them right. So, you know, interest rates go up, price offers go down and vice versa when, you know, when things change. It, we're in the, you know, we, it, this is about math. And it, it, it build, a building either pencils out or it doesn't. And that's okay. You know, we kiss lots and lots of frogs to find our princes and princesses. And, uh, you know, that, so that's part of, you know, the value that we bring to our, our partners is to be able to go do all that heavy lifting for them. Okay. So for people who are interested in checking out the podcast, we've mentioned it, it's realestateundergroundpodcast.com or just go wherever you get your podcast and look up Real Estate Underground. You mentioned Clark Street Capital. Yes. Uh, where's the URL that they could find you at for that? So that's uh, 
clarkst.com, C-L-A-R-K-S-T.com. Beautiful. And do you do like social media? Do you have places that you want people to follow you, find you online, or are those places the best places? To uh, no, we are everywhere. So we're in, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube now. I'm actually, my kids are are laughing hysterically uh, at me on a very day, uh, pretty much a daily basis that dad has a YouTube channel, <laughs> and uh, which is hilarious. And uh, so we're, you know, we're on Instagram as well. And, and we're Clark Street Capital everywhere. Clark S. E. Capital everywhere. What you got to do is at some point you got to be like, yeah, I just wanted to just check real quick. How many followers do you kids have? Yo, it's so oh. funny. I did that. I did that to my 15 year old the other day. I was like, how many followers do you have on TikTok? She goes, I don't know, like, you know, a couple thousand. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, how many followers do you have? A little more, a few more. I don't want to break your little heart. But uh <laughs> But yeah, it's funny. Well, dude, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate having you on. First of all, to Did represent you? Connecticut. So thank you. No, make yeah. forever. But obviously you're, you're such a giver, right? You, you really do give so much thought and care to how you put information out into the world. So I just want to say Thanks, thank man. you so much for, for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Truly my pleasure, Dan. It's really good to see you. And uh, thanks for the time. That is it. That's it for our interview this week. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you could leave us a review, Wherever you get this podcast, I would really appreciate it. I read every single one. It helps other people find the show. And look, I just appreciate it. You'd be doing me a solid. So if you could go ahead, leave us a review, give us a like or subscribe or whatever you can do. We really appreciate that. As always, thank you so much for listening to the show. I really appreciate you. And I will see you next week. Cheers. This is the podcastfactory.com.